ADT decided to take some systems offline and inadvertently or as part of the containment of the breach, this caused outages for some customers. Now, we don't know the extent of the outages or the service disruptions, but we do know that it was caused. And we do know that that's an unfortunate side effect for when these types of data breaches happen. To their credit, they probably acted fast enough so that there wasn't some kind of ransomware involved here, but there was some leaking of data. For sure. We know that. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of John Has Trust Issues, where I discuss issues relevant to zero trust and identity security in a few minutes. I'm John Martinez. I'm the security barista, also the technical evangelist here at StrongDM. And my issues come from my cat today. I love our cat. She's, she's great. She's, you know, small. She's very friendly. But... She just drags something into the house. It's small and furry. And oh my God, is it scurrying across the floor there? Anyway, we're going to be discussing today uh, the ADT security breach um, or second security breach. According to Bleeping Computer and also reported in Security Week, ADT has, has, has had two security breaches in as many months. The latest breach involves the use of stolen credentials and exfiltration of employee account data. According to reports, the credentials were stolen from a business partner. These are the third-party partners that we use in our businesses every day for doing things like processing data, for processing credit card information, you know, all sorts of stuff. This is critical for business today. You know, there didn't seem to be any customer information stolen out of this breach, um, but, you know, we, we don't know the full detail of the extent. But what we do know is that in an effort to contain the breach, ADT decided to take some systems offline and in inadvertently or as part of the containment of the breach, this caused outages for some customers. Now, we don't know the extent of the outages or the service disruptions, but we do know that it was caused. And we do know that that's an unfortunate side effect for when these types of data breaches happen. To their credit, they probably acted fast enough so that there wasn't some kind of ransomware involved here, but there was some leaking of data. For sure. We know that. Um, now we don't know the full impact of production, uh, for this data breach. So that's yet another thing to ascertain. But at the end of the day, we do know that this is a sad common tale. Um, while I don't have direct knowledge of ADT's operational controls or how they run ops in their environment, there's a lot of lessons here. Number one, you know, we do know, for, well, first and foremost, we do know that uh, according to the Verizon data breach report, if you haven't seen this, the 2024 version of this report does still show that the number one action in a, in a breach of, uh, of some kind is going to be stolen credentials, the use of stolen credentials. That comes in at a whopping 24%. Um, so we do know, again, that that's the number one action that takes place. And unfortunately, in this case, that's what happened. So let's get into what some of the lessons are that we can learn from here in our environments. Number one, implementing least privilege. So we've heard this for many years now that implementing least privilege is a way to go. I'm not saying that this is what happened in this case, but we do know that we can contain the blast radius if we implement least privilege so that those credentials that are potentially stolen can only do so much damage. Um, now, there's some more modern techniques that you can employ here uh, above and beyond least privilege. We're talking about zero standing privileges so that when employees come in in the morning, they log in, they have zero access to anything until they go through some kind of just-in-time access workflow and gain access to critical systems. Now, this goes hand-in-hand hand in hand with the previous point here. Number two, we're talking about MFA everywhere. Now, when I say MFA, I'm talking way more beyond, you know, your regular uh, SMS MFA, which is prone to things like SIM swapping attacks uh, and other things like that, right? You know, so we want to 
implement phishing resistant MFA. Uh, we're talking TOTP tokens. We're talking app, TOTP applications. Uh, we're talking about even in some cases, you know, depending on the criticality of your data or maybe not, you know, it's me. You want to implement the best practice possible. We're also talking about things like pass keys. We're talking about things like hardware based tokens. So that's MFA, MFA everywhere. You've seen me talk about this, that, about that particular topic many times. And number three, complete auditing, auditing and monitoring of your systems, especially your critical systems. You want to monitor the activity on those critical systems that your users are taking, the actions that your users are taking in those databases, for example, on those servers. Uh, and it, this includes your third-party partners. Now, if you don't have exposure to the audit logs that your third-party partners are collecting, you definitely want to demand that you get access to those as well. So logging is one thing uh, and storing those logs in a, in, in a log file or some kind of object storage or some kind of data warehouse only does so much. You need to be able to create action based on when you see patterns. So patterns of things like, you know, unusual, suspicious behavior, things like that. You want to be able to take action and alert when those things happen against your critical systems. And finally, enforcing zero trust is a must. So you want to create the policies like explicit verification of access and not just explicit verification of, uh, of access to your critical resources. So we're talking about things like challenging your users when they connect again to those critical databases as an example uh, with all of the different things I just talked about, things like MFA, et cetera, and going through just-in-time workflow. But you want to be able to verify and validate that the actions that those users are taking are also going to be the ones that they need to be taking at that particular time. So you want to be able to, for example, put just the right amount of friction for things like if, you know, drop table query is issued, right? Whether that's an approval workflow of some kind, whether that's an MFA of some kind, you want to be able to do that explicit verification and you want to be able to do it continuously. Another aspect of this is using contextual attributes. I'm talking about external signals uh, on uh, those actions and those access requests. So this would be things like device trust, if their laptop, for example, has also been compromised, which is usually the case in these types of events, there's some kind of malware, they were victims of some kind of phishing attack, you want to be able to take that context and apply that to your access, not just the request, but also the sessions live as they happen as well. Uh, these are just some, some examples of what you can do, what you can implement, and that's it. That is another episode of John Has Trust Issues. Thank you for joining me on this adventure. You can see all of the cited sources down in the description. Whoa, how did I get into this little box here? John Martinez, your security barista here. Hope you enjoyed this episode of John Has Trust Issues. Make sure you like and you subscribe to the Strong DM channel to get more relevant content like interviews, like more John Has Trust Issues episodes, like product walkthroughs for Strong DM, etc. And you can see all that by subscribing and liking our content. Thank you very much.